Wedgeside Podcast is a proud member of the Wedgeside Media Collective. This is episode 233. We welcome back Julia Felice, who recently released a vegan parenting book. But first, here's our side. Which side are you on? 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 On July 18th, there was an underground action that happened. We'll just play this little news clip. A farmer says the escape of thousands of animals from his central Minnesota farm will cost him more than $750,000. Someone released more than 30,000 mink from a farm in Eden Lake. Some of the animals have been recaptured. Reg Chapman explains why this crime could have a bigger impact on the area. They were on a mission when they did this. They knew what they were doing. Dan Lang believes his mink farm was targeted. They took down the fence in three different spots. This, ladies and gentlemen, is why you do your fucking homework. He thinks he was targeted. <laughs> Lang says someone used the cover of darkness to invade his property and release thirty to 40,000 minks. We have <laughs> like, mink dying. They were going to fucking die no matter what. Like, you have them dying? No, you're just not profiting from them right now, you fucking asshole. And you're not the one killing them. Lang says he and his family are in recovery mode, and neighbors, friends, and complete strangers are helping track down the animals. You're in recovery mode? Fuck you. You're just a piece of shit. I'm in recovery mode because I can't murder anymore. <laughs> Fuck you. They just say, hey, we got one of your mink. We're watching it for you till you get here. They mean everything. They mean everything to our family. <laughs> We've been doing this... Since 1936. They mean money. That's it. Money. This is all I... This is what I do. Sadly, Lang believes more than half of his minks will die. He says whoever thought they were saving the animals by setting them free actually sentenced them to death. Even that sentence is utter bullshit. Half of them are going to die. You're sentencing them to death. They're all going to die if you they weren't released. So in essence, they just... At, by this farmer's admittance, save 20 fucking thousand mink, which is bullshit to begin with because they're not all going to die. And honestly, that's one of the most hypocritical things to come out of your mouth. <laughs> I just sentence them to death. Yeah. Like you sentence them to death at the end of the season. Like, fuck you. There are groups out there uh, that uh, are uh, strongly opposed to this type of commercial operation There's for, lots of uh, us. raising mink. Stearns County Sheriff is working with his state and federal partners to track down the people responsible for this crime. Right next to the farm is a wildlife management area and a wildlife preservation area. We think perhaps uh, from what we've developed out there that maybe that's the way they came onto the farm. Chief Deputy Lentz says no one has claimed responsibility for releasing the mink. I actually like that. I am, look, my hat is off to these very professional individuals. Um, Thank you. So whenever these mink releases happen, the same false notions are expressed in the media that, and the Fur Commission hasn't really changed what it said in years. Be no, their narrative, they have a playbook. They do. And yeah. it's because it works. It works for their PR. Honestly, the reality is that mink can, in, in, in fact, they do survive in the wild when released. Um, even in 2009, in April, in partnership with Oxford University, they tracked the survival of released mink over eight years and found that none of the released mink died directly due to a lack of survival skills. How about that? If you think about it, they're not a completely domesticated animal. If you even think about cats, in some cases when cats are out in the wild, they will become feral again. It's just a thing that animals do. Yeah, these are not domesticated animals. And the areas that mink are released in most cases are native habitats for the mink anyway. Yeah, go go look at pictures of where this is. Yeah, those mink are just fucking fine. Way better than being turned into a coat for some upper class, out of touch piece of shit who just wants to show privilege. And so, honestly, you know, in the case that some may die... It could be true. Some might die at the hands of humans because of cars or other hazards like that. But in reality, they're all going to die. They were the born the to die. They were bred to die. 
And even if one mink out of that 40,000 gets free, that's one mink that wouldn't have been free and live. But in reality, way more than one mink is going to live. Tens of thousands. And so I call it a win. That'll make you want to quit your job and join the motherfucking resistance. Dive into our newly designed website and gorge yourself on one of the 500 plus videos and audio tracks from our vast library of anarchist films, hip hop and riot porn, or choose from one of our original shows like Trouble, Burning Cop Car, Vegas for Anarchy, Video Ninja Reports, and The Stimulator. Fuck Netflix. Watch sub.media. And now, here's Julia. Well, I got to tell you, I, I am super jealous of uh, new vegan parents now that they have like the resource, like your new book, The Baby and Toddler Vegan Feeding Guide. Because when we had our daughter, there was freaking nothing. I actually pulled the only book out to show Jordan that we could find, and it was printed in like 1981, <laughs> and it's ridiculously outdated and horrible hippie advice. And it looks dated. <laughs> Yeah, I'm so excited um, to have this out, and it's basically, it was inspired by, uh, I, I think I talked about it um, the last time I was on your show, about a horrible experience that I had um, after the, the birth of my son, and, you know, I I actually felt really overwhelmed with where to get all the information, but then I was... I've never doubted myself um, in raising my my kids on uh, plant based diets or vegan, but after that horrible experience where I was basically bullied, um, I sort of started questioning myself. And I, uh, my husband and I, we got every book you could imagine <laughs> like out there. But it's so overwhelming because every resource tells you something different. So um, and. Plus, you're tired, you don't have time, you're learning, you know, something completely new. And um, so I came up with this idea where, you know, I was already doing the research because my background is in science. Um, and what I've been doing with my kids has been working out really well. And um, it's nu- nutritionist or sorry, dietitian approved. Um, Because I did discuss with a dietitian and um, I decided, you know what, I'm going to do a a guide. It's going to be to the point, straightforward, um, and hopefully it'll help new parents out there or even those that are thinking of transitioning to a vegan lifestyle and have no idea where to even start. Um, So that's the background for the guide. Yes, but um, the exciting part is uh, Jeannie Messina actually helped me um, by reviewing the book because the one thing that I wanted it to be was accurate and safe. And um, I don't know if everybody knows who she is, but she's known as the vegan RD. Mm -hmm. And she is one of um, the people that I always uh, follow um, if there's some new study or claim coming out um she's one of the few people um or one of the first people who will um make a post about it and and discuss that so uh she donated her time to this guide and that was amazing because i really needed it to be safe and accurate especially with um just the pressure that we have from the media and uh, some of the medical community that still haven't caught up (laughs) <laughs> or realize that we're not going anywhere. We're still going to have kids, you know? <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah, she does She does a great job. One of the things I love that she does is she also kind of debunks the myths that vegans perpetuate about veganism. Mm. Yes, yes, exactly. I, 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 I know she has a new book out, and I can't wait to get my hands on it. I know she, she debunks a lot of myths in there, especially a lot of the fat phobia and things like that. Yes. What I what I really liked seeing is the part on skepticism and I just think pseudoscience is such a common thing in veganism and it's great to, to see that in there. 
Yes. And um, I wrote a, a little about that as well, since I mentioned before, my background is in science and um, I want parents to be able to sort um, through all that and be a little more aware of what it means to have evidence, evidence based information and not just believe anything and everything you read. Um, even when when I was looking for information, um, when I, I uh, when my son was born, sorry, about uh, like formula and, and things like this and, and different foods and people would actually write that um, carrot juice was an appropriate replacement for formula if a woman <laughs> yes 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 and even today that I don't know if you've heard of that news story um, from Belgium which is everywhere and um, where vegan diets are being blamed for the death of a baby um, even in the in the threads today on Facebook, there's people saying, "Oh well, couldn't they just have given the baby uh, a vegan uh, milk?" And it's like, no, because you know, and this is what what we really need to address. We need to make sure that parents have the right information because, no, you cannot just give a baby um, any plant milk. That's not how it works, and there's a reason why. Um, you either have to breastfeed or uh, give your baby a formula if you're unable to or if you choose not to or for whatever reason your baby isn't able to process uh, your breast milk. So, um, yeah. I used to think it was funny that soy milk always said not to be used as formula until I realized mm -hmm. that people actually thought that that was okay. And they still do, apparently. So I, I'm, not yeah, I'm not too familiar, familiar with, with the Belgium either. case. Do you mind uh, telling us a little bit about it? I've been seeing it since yesterday. And it's this couple in Belgium who had a seven-month-old. And I guess um, the mother, her milk never came in. And they decided to give the baby, um, I think, regular formula. But the baby wouldn't take it. So they assumed that the baby was lactose intolerant. I'm not sure they consulted with um, a doctor or anything. So they just decided that, baby, that the baby was lactose intolerant. So they decided to give the baby um, a mix of uh, oat milk. And I don't know how much the baby weighed, but by seven months, um, the baby was just not developing and was severely malnutritioned and he um, passed away. So if they thought he was lactose intolerant, that means he wasn't vegan before that, right? I don't know. They didn't really specify. It, the problem with these stories is like they read oat, me, oat milk and they assume that that's what was happening. That uh, it had to do with veganism. Whereas an infant isn't technically on a vegan diet because they should literally just be drinking milk. So vegan diet doesn't really have anything to do with, with anything. It was just a case of the parents not being aware or assuming things mm -hmm. that they shouldn't have, that they should have reached out for help. But the reason these stories are important for uh, vegan parents to be aware of is because one of these stories was actually used <laughs> against me uh, after the birth of my son. And I think I mentioned it um, when I was on your show before. Yeah. Where the doctor was like, well, you can't raise your child vegan um, and vegan parents have had their children taken away from them. And, you know, these are, are things that come up every once in a while. And just people just need to really be informed when these types of situations happen to break down the myths. Because um, I cover it in the book, but all major dietetic um, associations have come out in support of uh, plant-based diets for all stages of life. But the myth and the, the, the information out there is, is, you know, people have the opposite idea in their mind and they base it on these stories. So w one of the things that you have in there is the uh, skeptical vegan parents checklist. Would you mind talking mm -hmm. about that a little bit? Yes. Um, so... I wanted to 
help parents weed out um, from what would be evidence-based information and pseudoscience. So evidence-based means that it's actually based on something reliable or from a reliable source, whereas pseudoscience is usually based on opinions or ideas or basically whatever claim that anybody makes that for some reason takes off but has no basis. And um, so I go, I explain um, those differences and then I talk about um, sources, where to get sources of information, um, people to follow, to always stay skeptical of, uh, for example, even if someone claims to be a doctor, that doesn't mean that they're an expert in every single thing. And I also think it's it's important to to really think about why is someone going against the consensus of uh, a particular uh, topic or something that has been decided? If all the science points towards one direction, why is this person suddenly saying, hey, let's go try this, which is based on nothing or just something or an idea that I had or whatever. Um, and it's just a way to sort of try to help parents sort through all the, the information out there. What is the one piece of pseudoscience that you hear all the time that just drives you fucking crazy? <laughs> um, for a while, it was the Karaginen thing, which I specifically wrote <laughs> about in the book, where there were so many people... I still see it every once in a while, but so many people saying, oh, you can't, you know, drink uh, plant milk from the store because carrageenan. And and so that was one thing that was driving me up the wall. <laughs> <laughs> I still hear that um, from time to time. Yes. And it's one of the, I think, the, the safest foods. Uh, uh, the, um what's the word um well, ingredient used in products and foods one of the safest uh or has the safest ratings so when we last talked to you we, we we spent a little bit of time talking about uh intersectionality and the work that you do that have have you you know continued to along that work do you have anything new uh in that realm yes i started my own uh, vegan book publishing company wow um uh, and the first book published was my actual my uh, the the baby and toddler vegan feeding guide actually, and the project that I'm working on right now is trying to help raise the voices of vegans of color in the vegan movement. Um, I think it's important that um, vegans of color have a platform, and it's important that uh, I'm a vegan of color myself. But it's important that we're not uh, tokenized. It's important that we don't just have one person speaking for everyone because we all come from so many different backgrounds and experiences, but we're there. Um, and it's important that vegans that are not vegans of color realize that we are there and that veganism and the animal rights movement needs to be a safe space for vegans of color. But more importantly, the animal rights movement and vegan movement need to openly reject all oppression if they're going to get people of color to even take the movement seriously. So that's the the idea behind that. It's a two book project. The first is um, vegans of color um, stories um, and specifically speaking to uh, vegans that are not vegans of color. And the second volume is vegans of color um, explaining to people of color why uh, veganism and animal rights is a social justice movement and why um, it needs to be taken seriously. What are some ways inside the animal rights movement that you see uh, people just tokenizing people of color? Tokenizing? Yeah. Um, most likely when, 
most recently, several organizations just randomly started posting images of the people of color within the movement, or where organizations will invite, you know, the same person every single time to speak on behalf of a specific community when um, there are so many of us out there and some that have been doing the work for so long but still don't get any, you know, people don't really pay attention to them. So I think it's important to realize that um, one person doesn't speak for everyone and we all have, you know, important things to say as a community. So it's just, uh, look, we know a black person. We're okay. Yes. (laughs) Yes, exactly. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Those things are the reasons why I'm glad I just don't do social media. (laughs) It just drives me insane. Oh, oh. Yeah, so yeah, the problem, the problem is that social media now is the place where we are sort of able to, you know, get some of what's going on out there and sort of try to get a platform. Mm-hmm. So that's the thing why I'm kind of stuck on social media. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the best way to, to be an ally when we actually see those type of behaviors uh, happening? speak out um and you know if you see someone saying really problematic things and you know speak out say something and it shouldn't matter that this person saying really disgusting problematic racist sexist homophobic um anything um it shouldn't matter that they're a well-known person or you know a founder or someone that speaks out for a specific group of animals or for all animals, it shouldn't matter because whatever work they do is undone when, you know, you fail to recognize that you're still contributing to oppression. So I think what's important is vegans really stepping up and rejecting what's happening and going out and joining other movements and seeing what um, other groups are doing to fight oppression and bringing that back and of course supporting those groups but you know taking notes and bringing that back and realizing that veganism isn't going to go anywhere if we don't um, move towards pro intersectionality what in your opinion, is the best way to bridge that gap and to and to be more intersectional? Um, it's a difficult question because right now um, I see some vegans of color working so hard and everything is just undone when or it's just so frustrating when you know you're speaking up about why something is racist but then you have other vegans come up and say well this person does so much for this organization and um that should matter more than this or that and you're being divisive and so it's really difficult to to answer right now, but I think supporting um, projects like like the Vegans of Color um, book that we're working on, which will give Vegans of, of Color a platform um, and an idea of what we are actually about, and that you know we also deserve a voice in the movement. I think that's a start. But it's, it's tough right now. So in, in the book, one of the things that you have is that your tips and tricks. What, what is your favorite uh, little tip or trick uh, in your book? For feeding kids? Yeah, um, sorry. <laughs> I know, just jumping that, around. <laughs> <laughs> um, that would probably be um, the – so – my oldest um 
he likes uh, nut butter sandwiches, but sometimes he'll get bored of them. So what I did was I bought all these different types of, um, you know, bento boxes, how they have yeah. little shapes and little smiley faces and cars and things. So I bought a whole bunch of uh, cookie cutters and bento, um, the rice shape shapers and things like that. And when he's, you know, not really into his sandwiches anymore, I'll mix it up and I'll start making like little shapes and some will be really small, some will be dinosaurs and cars and things and he gets like, you know, more excited about them and he plays with them and then he eats them. So that's fun for him, but it's also fun for me because I think it's cute. <laughs> I want yeah. dinosaurs I want in dinosaur, my lunch. I want a dinosaur <laughs> sandwich. That yeah. sounds awesome. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> I'm missing out. <laughs> so secretly, secretly, it's it's a lot of fun for me too. <laughs> I'm going to go make a sandwich right after this and cut it out with a cookie cutter just to do it. <laughs> do it <laughs> <laughs> oh, i love that idea well uh it's been really really great talking with you again um how can people follow the work that you're currently doing um and then keep yes. keep in contact with to see when your your new projects are coming out we're on facebook under um sanctuary publishers sorry um sanctuary publishers uh is in uh, also sanctuarypublishers.com is a good way to, to keep up with um, what I'm doing. And I'm also on um, under Julia Felice Brook, B-R-U-E-C-K. Um, but I'm not so active on that page. So I'm really active on uh, Sanctuary Publishers. And we just posted an anti-racism um, video, which uh, I hope everybody will check out and share in uh, all over the place. Well, good. Uh, we'll put links to it in the show notes. Yeah, awesome. Great. Awesome. They- Thank you so much. And they can grab your book there too, correct? Yes. It's on, um, all the links are on www.sanctuarypublishers.com. And the book is on um, Amazon and also on Vegan Essentials. You can find it there too. Which Side Podcast is hosted and produced by Jordan Halliday and Jeremy Parkin of the Which Side Media Collective. With web design by Jordan Halliday and sound design by Jeremy Parkin. Booking by Mari Halliday. Go to wishsidecollective.org to check out the other shows in the collective. As always, Happy birthday, Jeremy. This is Bursts from Asheville, North Carolina. Fuck shit, damn. Happy birthday, Jeremy. Fuck shit, damn. Hey, Jeremy. Happy birthday from Stacy and Ozzy in the San Francisco Bay Area. Fuck shit, damn. Bye. Bye.